very happy to, to introduce Lucien Hardy, who's going to tell us all about the operational road to quantum gravity. He assured me that although there won't be a lot of explicit information theoretic interpretation of the quantum mechanics, it's just the whole orientation now of how we think about physics. So yeah, nobody needs to talk about it because it's always there. It's implicit. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so. so I was I was saying that um, just sort of quantum the, the information approach puts you in a kind of user interface sort of frame of mind. You have uh, knob settings and outcomes, so you're thinking uh, uh, from that point of view. Um, and so this operational approach in some sense is very much inspired by the whole information uh, program. Um, okay, I think that's the last time I have to use the word. Um, so, um, Like many people, I'm, I'm writing a paper. Um, I'm writing a paper, uh, and the title is uh, Operational General Relativity, Possibilistic, Probabilistic, and Quantum. Um, there should be a question mark over the word quantum, um, but the other two parts of it are, are um, relatively in place. Um, and the basic idea is to try to reformulate um, well, the, part, the, the first part of the paper is really about reformulating um, general relativity in a way that's similar to operational quantum theory. Um, so operational quantum theory is, uh, well, familiar to most people as the theory that uses uh, density matrices CP maps or super operators and uh, POVMs. Um, I have a different formulation of the theory, which is more useful uh, for what I have in mind. Um, so uh, this is the operator tensor. Uh, formulation of quantum theory. And I just meant to say, so the operational quantum theory, it goes back to, you know, um, Many people made contributions uh, you know, over, over, the, over the, uh, the previous century, uh, but it's always kind of been a sort of underdog of formulations of quantum theory, sort of the unsung working class hero. Um, you know, um, many people thinking about fundamental physics, they like, uh, you know, the sort of, sort of uh, they, they, they like, uh, you know, other formulations of quantum theory, you know, such as a Hamiltonian approach, path integrals approach. Um, but the operational approach, in some sense, is, is, is a good, honest interpretation, honest formulation of quantum theory. It's, it's what's used um, by people working in uh, quantum information. I've used the word again. Um, um, uh, you know, if you want to prove theorems in quantum information, uh, you want to prove something is or isn't possible, then often it's better to go to this uh, operational formulation of quantum theory. Um, so it's sort of the workhorse, if you like, of, of um, of, um, of um, quantum theory. Um, many people think, well, density matrices aren't really fundamental, uh, and so we should, we should think about pure states. Uh, but when you start thinking about uh, quantum information, then density matrices suddenly become, um, you, you start to think of them as more fundamental. And then just, just the mere fact that, um, that actually the decomposition into pure states for a density matrix is not unique uh, makes them perhaps seem more fundamental. Um, so my attitude is that one should really think of operational quantum theory as being, as being the, the, the sort of basis for, a, for an approach to quantum gravity. So like I was saying, I have this uh, formulation of operational quantum theory. I call it operator, operator tensor quantum theory. Uh, and you have boxes in this. So you can, you can wire together arbitrary circuits. So these circuits can be arbitrarily complicated. Uh, here we have um, just four uh, opera uh, operations in it. And they have uh, passing between them systems of different types. So the, the symbol represents the type of system. So here we have a system of type A, that might be an electron. System of type B, that might be a, a photon, another electron over here, and so on. Um, you can. Um, so this is, a, this is a diagram, a schematic diagram of an experiment that happens in the laboratory. 
But you can, you can write the same diagram down in symbolic notation like this. Um, Um, so I've just written the, these letters with the <coughs> superscripts corresponding to um, outputs and subscripts corresponding to inputs. And then I need to add, add an extra bit of information to this diagram, so this symbolic notation, because uh, I don't know where the wires go. So I'm just going to put integers on the different wires. So there's a wire going from box A to box B, and so on. Uh, and there, uh, so that is a description of the experiment. Okay, notice this isn't a calculation, this is just a description, an operational description of an experiment. But you might be interested in, in uh, calculating the probability associated with this. So I, I should be a bit clearer here. When, um, when, you, um, when we use the symbol A, we're referring not just to the box, but also to some particular outcome uh, on this box. So maybe, for example, this box has a red light, a blue light, and a green light that can flash. And when we say A, we're just interested in the case where the red light flashes. Okay, and likewise on the other boxes. So we can try to calculate the joint probability that the lights associated with each of these uh, boxes, each of these operations flashes. Okay, so we could be interested in this probability. And uh, in the operator tensor framework, you can write down an expression for this probability that looks like this. So the only difference is that these have hats on. So these are now mathematical objects, and what I've written down here is a calculation. Um, so we have the operational description of the uh, experiment uh, like this, um, which is just equivalent to this diagram. And then we have uh, the mathematical calculation, which is just given by an expression like this. Now, of course, I haven't told you what, what, what this means. Uh, whenever you have a repeated index, you have to take the um, partial trace over the appropriate part of the Hilbert space. These operators act on a Hilbert space that's determined by the um, subscripts and superscripts they have. And I'm not gonna have time to tell you much more about that. Um, but what's nice about this kind of expression is, um, is that it's, it, the, the calculation for the circuit has the same structural form as the operational description of the circuit. In fact, you can also write this calculation down as a diagram using sort of you know, Penrose style notation just by putting hats on here. So now I'm changing this into a calculation. Um, so I call this the composition principle. So the idea is that uh, it should be possible to, um, to um, write down the calculation for a, a physical situation in terms of an expression, a mathematical expression that has the same um, structure, compositional structure, as the thing it's a calculation for. Let me just move this out of the way. Um, that seems like a good principle. Uh, and um, so I want that to be true also in these uh, reformulations of general relativity. Um, so there's a few features here so this box, let me just highlight a few features. So we have these boxes. They have uh, various in inputs, various outputs. Uh, you can also imagine these boxes have some settings on them. So here's a setting. It's a knob that you can adjust. And then they also have some outcomes, like you might have a needle that you can read its position off against a, um, a, re a, meter, a, reta, a, a reta against some scale. So you have um, uh, 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 settings 
and you have outcomes. You also have inputs and outputs. Um, so I'd like to have this same kind of structure in an operational reformulation of um, general relativity. Okay. So um, what about general relativity? Um, of course, some people in this room will be experts in GR and some people not. So let me give you a quick summary of, um, of general relativity, uh, especially for those people who aren't experts. Okay, just um, set the scene. Um, so we have some things we need. However, there's a twist in the tw detail at the end, so let me come to that. Uh, well, first of all, even before we start, we have some fields. I'm going to represent the fields we have in general relativity by this, uh, this uppercase uh, phi. And the fields consist of the, um, the metric fields, sometimes called the gravitational fields, uh, and various matter fields. So the matter fields might include um, you know, um, uh, electromagnetism, uh, so electromagnetic fields, uh, um, um, fluid fields, and, and so on. Whatever matter you have in the situation uh, will be here. And where we start is we start in special relativity, and we have some uh, field equations. Okay, so these field equations would be like Maxwell's equations, um, the, um, the matter field equations written in, um, in Lorentz invariant form, so special relativistic form, uh, and whatever else you have. Um, and there's a special process for converting special relativity field equations into general relativity field equations. And this involves, um, well, it uses the, um, the equivalence principle, and it involves um, various things. So you take, you start off with coordinates in a global inertial reference frame, and you replace those with uh, general coordinates. I've used an underscore bar to sort of indicate flat, a flat uh, reference frame. Um, you, um, you replace um, partial derivatives by covariant derivatives, uh, and you replace the Minkowski metric, which is a constant thing, and I'm told that you betray your background by what signature you use, <laughs> and, and I can't remember which one is which. Um, so you replace the Minkowski metric with the, um, this metric. This is a general metric uh, and has, because it's a symmetric tensor, so it has 10, in the case where space-time is four-dimensional, it has 10 free parameters in it. Now there's a problem, because over here we started with, we assume a complete set of field equations from special relativity. Um, but now, we've got the same number of equations, except we have an extra 10 parameters. So we need another 10 equations. And these 10 equations are provided by the Einstein field equations. OK, so it all looks good except that there's a twist in the tail, which is that uh, it turns out that there's an identity on, on this. If you take the covariant derivative of, the, of this object, I should say this object is defined entirely in terms of the metric. Uh, uh, if you take the um, covariant derivative of this, then it's identically equal to zero. 
just on the basis of the way that G was defined. Okay. So you don't need to know what mo most of this means, but what is important is that we thought we had enough equations and then suddenly they've been taken away from us. The rug has been pulled from underneath our feet and we're four equations short. So that means that uh, if we have some situation, we have as much boundary information as we might want, we cannot solve, uh, to, we cannot solve to get a unique solution. Um, well, the reason for this is that um, these equations, all of the equations, the GR field equations and Einstein's equations are invariant under uh, general coordinate transformations or uh, in more general terms, they're invariant under different morphisms. Uh, and so what you say is, well, all the different solutions you get with some given uh, boundary conditions are equivalent up to these general coordinate transformations. You see here we have these four equations and that corresponds exactly to um, the number of equations we have under, you know, if we, if we, if we change our coordinates. Um, so the new coordinates, the prime coordinates expressed as a function of the unprime coordinates. Um, so um, it looks like a coincidence from this point of view that it gives the right number of equations. Okay, so the solution to this is like I said, you, um, you have to interpret your solutions as being meaningful only up to these general coordinate transformations or, ab or different morphisms. So let me write down um, a solution. So since I come from a background in quantum foundations, uh, uh, I got kind of nostalgic for the letter psi. So I decided to give it a prominent role. Um, so I'm gonna write down my solutions as psi tilde. I'll explain what the tilde is for it in a moment. Where at each point P, I specify some fields, they're a function of P. Um, and I do that for all P in some manifold. So that's a solution in GR. Um, but like I said, you can perform a diffeomorphism on this solution. A diffeomorphism is just the abstract way of talking about a general, uh, an active coordinate transformation. Uh, and you'll still get uh, a solution that has the same physical content. So diffeomorphism is notated like this. So I'm acting on this solution with a diffeomorphism. Uh, and what the diffeomorphism does is it takes, um, it takes points on the manifold to new points. It uh, also, when, when it acts on fields, sorry. when it acts on fields, it, um, it pushes them to the new position. So the field that was at point P is dragged along to the new position uh, Q, uh, and also it transforms the fields appropriately. So this is this solution now acted upon by an active diffeomorphism. Um, and so now we can ask, well, in, in, in the general relativity community, people say, people talk about observables. And I'm gonna change the word to beables. So we can ask, what are the beables? What are the real things in this physical theory? And the beables are functions Uh, that's invariant under different morphisms. Okay. So any function of the solution which has the property that it gives, returns the same value when, act, when this uh, solution is acted upon by any different morphism uh, is, uh, is, is a beable. 
So there's kind of a problem here, and this is a, a deep conceptual problem with, uh, with general relativity. Um, so imagine you have some, some manifold. Here's some manifold. And I, I'm interested in what's happening in this particular region of the manifold. Okay, so here's some manifold M. And I'm interested in what's happening in this small region of the manifold here. Uh, so imagine I, I write down some function for some real stuff that's happening inside this small region of the manifold. Okay, and I say, well, that's the real stuff that's happening inside this part of the, man of, of the manifold. The only problem is now if I can hit the solution with a different morphism, which will take all the fields that were in this region and take them somewhere else over here uh, and bring different fields into this region with different properties. And so, in general, I'll get a different value for any non-trivial function I write, which only has support on some part of the manifold. Um, so there's a problem that you can't talk about reality with respect to the manifold. One way to put it is that the coefficient, between the, uh, the coefficient of friction between the manifold and reality is zero. You can't stick reality onto the manifold. Uh, it simply doesn't uh, live there. Um, so I know you normally take questions at the end, but are there any questions up to this point? Does that mean you can only get a global properties? That's right. So that's what people normally say. People normally say, well, this means you can only really talk about global properties of the solution. Um, the problem with that is, is look, <laughs> here's some local stuff going on around us. Uh, so we've got to be able to account. Yeah, so we've got to be able to account for that. Uh, and if you're taking an operational approach to GR, then that becomes especially urgent to deal with it. Um, okay. Any other questions on this? No. Um, one, one thing you can do is you can define, so the reason I introduced the tilde is because I want to now remove it. You can define this object, which is you can um, take the set of all solutions uh, uh, acted, on, acted on by the um, diffeomorphism. So this is a, a, you know, obviously an infinite uh, set of objects. But, this, but now, in terms of this object, you can say that the beables are just functions of, of this object. Because functions don't, and the set has no order uh, on its objects. So this, um, this is a good way of writing down what you mean by the, the beables. OK. Um, so I, I replaced, um, so usually the things I've called beables are called observables in general relativity. Uh, and I've deliberately um, replaced that word with the word beable. So now that the word observables is freed up for a, a more specific use. Uh, so let me talk about uh, uh, observables. Um, and it's worth, it's worth saying that um, if you're going to take a, an operational approach to general relativity, there's sort of two broad strategies you might adopt. One strategy would be to give yourself uh, clocks and, and test particles and, and maybe rods and, and, and uh, fluxometers and various uh, uh, instruments as primitive objects, and then try to construct a theory with reference to those objects you take as primitive objects. Uh, so after I thought about it for a while, it seemed that that was, to me that that was the wrong approach. And an alternative approach is just to define everything in terms of the fields that you're given. So the idea here is just to suspend belief. Imagine that general relativity is a complete theory just in terms of these field equations uh, and uh, try to extract your operational objects uh, from those. So that's uh, what I'm going to do. Um, and um, the, the approach I'm taking is, is, 
uh, it's, it's motivated by a paper by Westman and Sonego. So they didn't have this kind of operational purpose in mind. They were simply trying to reformulate um, um, general relativity. Um, but, um, but some of the techniques that they used are, are useful for my purposes. Um, so, um, so the idea is you start by nominating a set of scalars. So these are scalars that are formed from the fields you have up here. So you can form scalars from these fields just by uh, uh, contracting over indices so you have no indices left over. You're also allowed to use covariant differentiation as part of that process. Um, so I want to extract some set of scalars. And um, here I'm just being operational, so there's no fundamental significance to these scalars. They're sort of contingent on the way we look at the world. Here I'm trying to find some objects that will uh, be a good uh, candidate for what we see operationally. So these scalars uh, are, um, are going to describe our actual observations. So they're, they're contingent. So you could have chosen a different set. You know, differently constructed uh, observers might want a different set of scalars. It's a sort of choice that we make. And now we can imagine a space whose axes are the values of these scalars. Okay, I'm just drawing three because of the limitations of representation. Um, okay, and uh, the next thing we can do is we can uh, look at uh, a solution, like uh, this solution, and then for each point P in the manifold, we can look at the fields that live at that point, and then from those fields calculate these scalars, and then plot that point into this graph. And if we do that for every point P, we'll end up with some, some um, surface. I'm just drawing part of the surface here. So the manifold, uh, the, that, that solution will get uh, mapped to um, some surface that lives in this space. I'm going to call this space op space. The operational space. Um, OK. And um, if you think about it, this surface will have an uh, intrinsic dimension that's no greater than the dimension of space time. So, uh, so the dimension of this surface won't be greater than 4, even though there can be more scalars. Um, okay. uh, so if you think about it, each of these scalars is a function of P or X, let's say. If you, uh, so if you move around on the manifold in the vicinity, you're only moving in four, dimension, four dimensions, so the same will be at that time. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's the first point. The second point is, well, let's look. What, what happens if we plot this solution instead into, into here. Uh, well, scalars have the property that their, their, their values are not affected by a different morphism. They're simply pushed along the manifold, but they don't change their values. So what that means is that if you plot uh, that solution instead, you get the same surface. Um, so this is in the Westman and Sonego paper. Um, so in the Westman and Sonego paper, they wanted to choose a set of scalars that were sufficiently large, large that this surface would contain all the information about uh, generic solutions. Uh, but my purpose is different. I want to choose a set of scalars here to, be, to correspond to some contingent set of, of uh, things you might want to observe, you know, depending on how you're, you're, you're constructed and what sorts of properties you're looking at in the world. The set of scalars more independent to um, well, I mean, you certainly don't want them to be simply related, like multiples of each other, that's redundant, but, but they, they could be. I mean, it's better to choose an independent set, yes. But it may be, it, it depends on what choice you make. There could end up being constraints. Um, if you choose, you know, some, some choices of scalars will actually have constraints so that the, just, just on the basis of the way they define, you'll actually end up being constrained to a subspace, subspace of operational space anyway. 
will increase the number of legs here can be constructed. That's right, yeah. We only want to consider a finite number that are sufficient to sort of capture the kinds of observations we make. Um, yeah, of course, you can construct an infinite number, but we only need a finite number. Um, yeah, and for the sake of argument, let's imagine that they're all independent of one another. You can certainly choose sets of scalars that have that property. And, and also, they're good candidates for being the kinds of things we observe. Um, yeah, so, so, the, so the idea is that th this is the world we live in. You know, when I say this book is here, it's local, it's local in this world, okay? And the idea is that, that the things we observe, the, the direct observations we make, consist, uh, are basically functions of sets of point coincidences in, in this space. Um, let, let me give this surface a name. I'm going to call it gamma. Uh, and now what you can do is, you know, if you are making observations, you might just be interested in a small part of the world. Uh, so you can draw an arbitrary shaped uh, volume inside this operational space. I'm just going to draw a, a kind of rectangular cuboid shaped thing because it's easier. But it could be arbitrary shaped. So it's meant, it's meant to penetrate this, um, this surface. Okay, so there's a, 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 an arbitrary volume inside this operational space uh, that penetrates this surface. Well, it doesn't have to, but this, in this case it does. I'm going to call this arbitrary volume A. Um, and then the surface here, the part of the surface that's, um, that's, um, that's cut out inside the box, I'll call that A gamma. Okay. So just you think about this. You could think of this region A as corresponding to a set of possible things you might observe. It might be your sort of laboratory with all the possible things that might happen in it. And then this set gamma A is what you actually see. Uh, and it's, it's local, but it's local in this space. It's local in operational space. So we're going to try and formulate everything locally in operational space. Um, One thing we can do is we can look at this, one of these solutions and just consider the points on the manifold that are plotted into region A. So that's the... Um, so this is region A. This, this is the set of points in the manifold that end up getting plotted uh, into this region. Is that clear? Um, of course, we can also form a different morphism on this. And we get um, basically, I'm not going to write it down, we get. Um, we end up with a different um, set of points for the manifold, um, but it's basically equivalent. And we can form we can form this object. So what we've done now is we've taken the solution and we've just looked at the part of the solution that's pertinent to a particular region of our operational space, similar to um, taking the reduced density matrix, if you like, in quantum theory. Um, we've taken the part of the solution that's relevant just to the particular part of space that we're, we're in. Uh, and then we can, um, we can construct this object, which is just basically gives you a, a, a sort of an invariant thing. Um, And we can talk about beables for the region A. And those are functions of psi. And we can talk about observables for the region A. 
and those are functions of gamma. Okay, any questions at this stage? Okay. Um, so, in quantum theory, we're interested in looking at you know composite systems. We have two systems. We're interested in what happens when we describe them in a composite way. We can try to do the same thing here. Um, so let's do that. Um, um, first of all, we might be interested in joining this kind of t uh, tilde solutions. Oh, I should draw a diagram. Um, so here, what we're going to do now is we're going to imagine we have a second region which can be adjacent to the first one. This is region B. Uh, and the um, surface where they meet, I'm going to call that A. Okay. Um, so I want to define this object where we join two solutions. And the idea is that we only keep uh, these two solutions if there's appropriate matching uh, at the boundary. So that um, the new, so if this is a solution and this is a solution, for the total thing to be a solution, it has to match at the boundary. So you, have, you end up with a solution uh, globally. So, um, we just have the empty set if uh, there's no matching. And we take the union if there is matching. Right, yeah, so this is a very good question. Um, so you have to, um, so it took me a while to understand how to do that, and it gets quite detailed. You have to, um, um, you have to work out how to write down your boundary conditions, but the boundary conditions, um, you, you, you can imagine writing boundary conditions on a manifold. You have two parts of a manifold, they meet, and you have local field equations, so there's gonna be some boundary conditions there. Um, uh, but now we want, to, um, well, let's see. Um, now we want to be sure um, that they're, they're matching. Um, you know, wherever they meet in here, they have to match. So it, it does take some care, and I, I don't think I can, I can really go into much detail. So what, what, one thing that's important, though, is it's not just about the fields matching, but also the manifolds themselves have to match. Uh, so you need two kinds of matching. First of all, the, the manifolds have to meet up, and then secondly, the, the, the fields. It's like uh, you know, if you're trying to put an extension on your house, um, then first of all, you have to put the, you know, the brickwork in place and then the wallpaper on top of it. But the brickwork is important too. Otherwise, the wallpaper will rip. Yeah, but it, it gets quite detailed and I don't think I can go to, into it in detail. Okay. So, yeah. So, so this is joining two tilde solutions. But then I want to join um, these solutions, uh, these objects. Uh, where are they? Here. Um, I should comment on this. This is a, this is a very heavy-handed way of writing down a sort of diffeomorphism invariant object. Uh, and, and of course, you'd never do a calculation like this. You'd never sit down and calculate all the diffeomorphisms of, an, of this. But it's a useful bookkeeping device. If you're trying to see the structure that's independent of, of this sort of, you know, this sort of uh, specific um, representations of the solution, then this is a very good bookkeeping device for that purpose. Um, so, so how do I join two of those together? Well, there's a natural 
when a natural way of doing that, given this, um, which is just <coughs> that I form the set of um, all of, all of these cases where I'm acting on them separately with different morphisms. I'll just write it down. So what I've done is uh, I've, I'm going through all the solutions in phi A. All these solutions are physically equivalent to each other, uh, but they are represented differently. And all the solutions in phi B, and one by one, I'm checking to see if they match at the boundary. Uh, and in the cases where they match, I keep them. And in the cases where they don't, I throw them away. OK. So that's the most natural way of joining two solutions. Now, something strange happens at this point. Well, here's something that's not strange. If I look at the um, observables in region AB, um, they're a function of gamma AB. Um, so, um, just a function of gamma A union gamma B. So what you see in the co composite region uh, is, is just the union of what you see locally in each of the two regions A and B. Uh, so that's true for the, direct, the things you directly observe. But the B, for the Bables, it's a different story. For the Beables, we can have that the, the Beables associated with region AB are not given by any function of the Beables for each of the two regions separately. And uh, let me just sort of outline an example of where this kind of thing happens. Um, imagine you have some, uh, I'll just describe it in, uh, on the manifold in um, two plus one dimensions, just so I can draw it on the blackboard. So imagine you have some, some uh, circularly, so, so some rotationally symmetric distribution of matter uh, like so. Um, except that there's a small asymmetry, there's some asymmetry away from this boundary. So here's the boundary between the two regions. Away from this boundary, there's some small asymmetry uh, sort of off center. So these things aren't quite symmetric. Um, but they are, they are rotationally symmetric in the vicinity of this boundary. Okay. And um, If you evolve this in time, um, then um, if you choose the, the region of symmetry to be sufficiently thick, then it will remain um, symmetric around this boundary uh, for some uh, uh, finite period of time. Now, you can introduce enough scalar fields in here so that this middle region here gets plotted to one region on operational space, call it region A, and this exterior region gets plotted to another region, B. Okay, it's not completely obvious how to do that. You have to be careful introducing your the various fields, physical fields. Um, so I have an example using um, dust fluids, uh, where region A, the one in the center, occupies a different part of operational space from region B. Um, but now you can see, if you write down the solution for region A, 
and a solution for region B on a, on a manifold, because you have this rotational symmetry, it'll match for all rotations. You'll get matching for all rotations. Um, so that means you can, you can match this for all different rotations. However, the distance between these asymmetries that I talked about, the ones that are sort of away from the boundary, will be different for each of those rotations. So they'll be physically distinct. So that means that um, when you join two solutions, like I have done, and then you check over, and then you go over all possible diffeomorphisms, you'll get, um, you'll, you'll get physically inequivalent solutions. So in particular, uh, this set here will consist of physically inequivalent uh, uh, solutions here. So you end up getting a natural notion of uh, mixed solutions forced on you. So I started off just defining this to be um, all diffeomorphisms of a given uh, solution. So all these are physically equivalent. But when you join them together, you end up getting, in some cases, uh, physically inequivalent ones. So now we should think of a solution, psi, whether it's for a composite region or even just an individual region, as possibly being mixed. It may have physically inequivalent objects in it. So it's nice that this notion of pure and mixed is kind of forced on you um, by the most natural way of thinking about how to join uh, two, um, two um, solutions. Um, and um, what it means is that um, you have a kind of non-separability. Kind of, it's dif different from the non-separability you get in quantum theory. Um, here you have, well, pure and pure implies mixed. In quantum theory, you can have mixed and mixed consistent with pure. for the composite. Um, but it's, um, yeah, but I think I still haven't quite clarified the important point, is if, if you do happen to, to know that your solution for the composite region is a pure solution, so you start off with some pure solution for the composite region, then you look at the two solutions that are induced in each of the two regions from that initial pure solution um, so you now have a complete description in each of the two regions. So I start off, well, let's do it over here, I have a drawing. I start off with a composite region. Uh, I have a, a pure solution for the composite region. And now I use that pure solution to obtain solutions in each of the two regions, A and B. And then I join those two solutions together. I don't get back to the pure solution I started with. I've kind of lost information. There's some information that you lose that's not locally represented uh, in, in each of these boxes. And uh, you, you, when you join them together, you, you, you kind of don't regain it. So that's the kind of, that's the non-separability that you get uh, in, in general relativity, in this operational approach. Any questions at that stage? If I just hand you a solution, can you tell me whether it's pure or mixed, or is it, you start off with solutions then you're doing construction? I mean, if you hand me a set, so these I solutions are, are, are sets of solutions. Yes, sorry, yeah. So it's already a very difficult problem, process. just just to check whether you know to, to check whether two solutions are different morphs and equivalent right. is a difficult problem. But in principle, let's imagine you can do that. So let's imagine that's easy. Uh, then, um, then if I have a solution, I can go through that solution and test to see how many inequivalent types of solution I have in in, in the set. And so if there's only one type then it's pure. If there are many types, it's, it's mixed. So the mixture would show up in the, when you're looking at the diffeomorphism. Yeah, so this, this is a, so I should just now think of a, a, a solution as a set, a set of these, a set of different types of these, except there is the constraint that for any member that does appear, all the diff, right. uh, uh, all the diffeomorphisms, they also have to appear. But it could be that there's more than two inequivalent classes, okay. more than one inequivalent class in, inside there. Yeah. Okay. 
So in, in principle, you can check that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, in fact, I define an operation called sort, which returns the set of pure solutions that are um, are in, in there. Yeah. So in principle, that that's well defined. But from a computational point of view, it's difficult. To, to, but who cares about uh, uh, how difficult something is to do computationally? Okay. Um, yes. So you, you so you have so you're thinking of saying having a, a like a single particle that has can be have support in two different regions that meet, uh, and then you could talk about the global phase. But the, if the particle happens to be have no support actually in the if the wave function is zero in the vicinity of the boundary, then yeah. relative phases aren't. Um, so you do pass this test um, for any yeah, for any phase, right? Um, and yet yeah, still, it's true that the relative phase globally is significant. Um, yeah, that may be, I have to think about it, but it does sound like it's a similar, a similar sort of example. Yeah. I mean, in some ways, I'm hoping the surprise is the other direction, that, that general relativity starts to have quantum-like properties, you know, um, and, um, and so it means that they're... Um, so Yakir Haranov has been given this uh, course at Perimeter, uh, and he started on, on the first day by saying, um, you know, there's these two great theories from the last um, um, century, general relativity and quantum theory, and general relativity is conceptually clean. It's clear, it's not, not, not mysterious, and it's, it's quantum theory which is, has the problems. Uh, but I think general relativity is actually, when you start to look at it properly, when you really think about what it means for observers in, in, in the world, it starts to have mysterious properties too. And this starts to bring these things out. So, um, so, um, so I'm actually I'm heartened if there are examples like this because uh, that's kind of the point I'm trying to make is that general relativity is also mysterious and it has sort of quantum properties. I would have liked it better if these two lines had been the same. Uh, and may maybe, maybe you can find examples where that's true. So, th so that would be good. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Say again, sorry. So it's not a priori given, it, it's, it's, it's contingent on, you know, just like when you do in quantum theory, it's the same as the Heisenberg cut. So in quantum theory, you know, you, you, you look at some experimental situation, you say, I'm gonna treat these as the sort of part of the world I'm gonna describe classically, I'll associate out outcomes with those. You know, a different creature might have, might have chosen a different set of, um, you know, a different set of things to be on the other side of the Heisenberg cut. So it, it's contingent on how you approach the world. And that's okay, because we're taking an operational approach. If I, was dis if I was saying this was completely fundamental, then we'd have a problem, but it's, it's not meant to be like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so let's see. When, when am I, I'm supposed to finish at? Well, the session is at 2.15. Yeah. So should I just keep, you're the chair, so I can keep going, say, till 10 past or five, five past? Okay, good, yeah. Um, okay. So, so when, I, when I gave the example of quantum theory, we talked about these boxes that have lights that flash. And I've told you what the lights that flash were. Hang on, let me just draw that, draw that diagram again. We have operations in quantum theory. We have, uh, well, reader, you know, we have meters and lights that flash. And they correspond to where this, um, where this gamma A set is. Uh, we also have um, inputs and outputs. We have, uh, uh, in, in the case of general relativity, we just treat all those on the same footing. Uh, and these correspond to these um, boundaries. 
between the, um, between the different regions. That's why I use the same kind of lettering. Um, and then the one thing I haven't told you about is what the knob settings correspond to. Um, so let me talk about that uh, a bit. Um, so normally when people um, think about general relativity, they imagine you have some initial state at the beginning of time, and then you uh, evolve it. Uh, there's these sort of formulations of GR that allow you to evolve, the canonical formulations of general relativity allow you to evolve the state in time, uh, and then you get a solution over space-time. And there's this sort of block universe point of view that the solution is just given. Um, but you can think about it differently, uh, at least, at least in an effect from an effective point of view. So imagine um, you have a, a captain who's um, driving a, a spaceship, okay, uh, and and you're trying to solve the field equations for that situation of the captain driving a spaceship, uh, but you don't want to solve all the way down to the resolution of his brain. You know, this is, that would be very impractical if you had to sort of look at what the neurons inside his brain are doing. So you solve, you know, whatever practical level you, 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 you can. Uh, and now the captain makes a choice. He decides to turn left or, or turn right. And if he turns left, then all the, the metric fields and the matter fields will be affected in one way. And if he turns right, they'll be affected in another way. Um, and, um, of course, you could solve that situation from the beginning of the universe by taking into account the neurons in his brain, or at least, you know, the, the subatomic particles that eventually became neurons in his brain. Um, um, you could imagine trying to do that, uh, but uh, you, don't, you don't need to. And instead, you can take a sort of an effective point of view um, and just think of, uh, think of things, uh, um, in, in, uh, think, think of these decisions being introduced into the solution when, when, when you need them. Um, so just like say how that would work. Imagine rather than having just one captain uh, driving just one spaceship, we have a, a vast fleet of spaceships, uh, so vast that we can think of it as forming a, a dust fluid. A, a dust fluid in general relativity is, is, is uh, basically a fluid where you imagine each of the fluid uh, elements is following a, a, a geodesic unless it's acted upon by some external force. Uh, so you imagine you have this vast fleet of spaceships that you can think of as being a dust fluid. So you can describe them by the sort of the, 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 the fields that are appropriate for describing a dust fluid. Um, and then um, um, you can imagine that the, the captains across this fluid sort of make different decisions how to, how to you know, and they can do that in a, in a sort of at least a slightly coordinated fashion so that you don't have discontinuities. Um, and um, you can imagine that their decisions are controlled by some other field, I'm going to call it an agency field, which basically says what setting they put the, um, the, the, the steering wheel or joystick. I don't know how spaceships are exactly. Um, and um, 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 and what, one way to think about that in, in GL would be to imagine that the spaceship is powered by interaction with a, another fluid, uh, a wind fluid. There, there are these designs for spaceships that are powered by um, photons coming from uh, stars. You could imagine uh, the spaceships are actually powered by, they have a sail, and you orient that sail, that's what the captain's choice is, and then the spaceship moves, uh, interacts with the, 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 the wind fluid and it moves in a particular direction. So then you could describe, um, uh, then you'd have a, you know, for a given agency field, you'd have a complete set of equations and you'd be able to solve and find a solution. If you had a different agency field, you'd get a different um, um, set of, uh, you, you'd get a different solution. Uh, and this is all kind of effective um, because uh, you can imagine that if you actually were able to solve for the captain's brain, then you wouldn't need to do that. Uh, of course, you may take the point of view that it isn't effective, that there's something fundamental about, um, about these decisions. Um, um, but if we don't want to be inconsistent with the usual point of view for general relativity, we can imagine it as an effective way of thinking about GR. Um, so let's imagine these agency fields are some set of tensors so I had already um, the set of tensors phi. So I had already phi. And now I'm going to have also, these were the, um, the fields that describe the, the physics. I'm going to add to those a set of agency uh, tensors. I'm just going to describe them by, um, by chi. Um, and then if you do that, it seems that you need to introduce one more kind of field 
you know, because the, the action of, the, of, of, of these captains will only be felt in the forward time direction. Uh, but general relativity is, is time symmetric. Um, so um, so, so, so um, it's sort of difficult to know how to tell the equations um, uh, which way they should feel this. So it seems you have to introduce also another field, uh, called it tau, which basically at each point indicates uh, a time direction. It indicates one of the two light cones as being the forward time direction. Um, so these are, these are effective notions that are a consequence of the way you're uh, looking at the physical situation. Okay, there's still a problem here. Um, you know, if, if it's, it's difficult, you can't, to say that you make a choice, you have to be able to describe what that choice is. Uh, and these are just tensor fields. Uh, the things that we can describe or we can observe, according to my earlier assertions, are scalars. Uh, so I can't quite think of these as being choices that the captain makes or the captains make. So instead, I want to use these things and extract um, um, from here, extract, I, mean, I could also use tab. I think I'm just going to use these two, extract um, a set of scalars uh, which describe the choices that are made. Okay, just like S uh, was used previously, now we have another set of scalars that describe the choices. Okay. Um, and now you can um, imagine, you imagine you're trying to coordinate this vast fleet of spaceships. Well, you have to tell the, all the captains what to do, and all they can do really is make choices based on what they see. So you can decide that Q should be a function of S. Okay. Um, and then if you're in a particular region like A, then you can define this object. So basically, this is telling you, uh, so you've got some strategy. It's telling you uh, this is a global strategy. This is uh, the strategy as it pertains just to some particular small region of your operational space. And this is the knob setting. Um, so that's how they get incorporated into, um, into the, um, the, the physics. Um, so. Like I said, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, the paper I'm writing is very long, and I've only actually been able to go through the, very, the, 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 the first part of it where I set up the operational uh, framework. The thing I, uh, I do in subsequent sections is show how to, how to define operations that can be glued together, and then how to associate generalized states with them, so that just like you know, at the beginning I showed you how it works in the operator tensor framework where you have this composition principle, you have the operational description, and then you can map that onto a calculation that has the same structure. So you can do the same thing here. And you can do it um, in, um, in, in two cases. Uh, in the possibilistic case, so what your objective there is, is you have some operational description of some things that might or might not be true. Uh, you know, so you have a whole bunch of these different regions, and you have some operational description of what might, not be tr might, why, what might or might not be true. You have knob settings, you have outcomes. Uh, and um, and uh, you want to know if, if that particular configuration is possible or not. And it's only possible if there are some underlying solutions to the field equations that make it possible. Um, so I um, so have a framework for determining whether that works or not. And like I say, it, it obeys this kind of composition principle. And then you can also imagine that you have probabilities introduced uh, into the picture. Um, and um, and then those are treated in a pretty standard way as sort of ignorance probabilities, and you're able to set up a framework that's sort of probabilistic rather than just possibilistic. And then the last part of the paper is to outline um, some general approaches to quantum gravity. Um, so I have, um, in imitation of um, a book that Lee Smolin wrote, I have three roads to quantum gravity. Um, I call them the abstract, the ontological, and the principled. The idea of the abstract approach is, is, is really just quantization. You say, well, I've got this classical 
theory with, you know, with state spaces that are kind of classical, like, you know, they're sort of like probabilistic state spaces that are, are more like probability simplexes. And I want to turn them into um, quantum-like state spaces that are seeded by uh, Hilbert spaces. So I have a, an idea about how to do that. Uh, it's incomplete, but I, I've made some progress. Uh, the second idea, uh, the ontological approach, is, is kind of radical, and I don't believe it, but it, at, least, at least it's not impossible um, that it might be true. Um, shall I stop there or shall I carry on? <laughs> it's five. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's not impossible that it might be true. And this is that um, operational general relativity, especially once you've introduced um, probabilities, actually gives you quantum theory. Okay. Now, you might not have believed that was possible at the beginning of this lecture because general relativity is defined by a set of local field equations. But hey, that's locality with respect to the manifold, which we've already seen the manifold. Uh, the manifold is you can't stick reality onto the manifold. It doesn't stick. Uh, and once you start to formulate um, general relativity with respect to some kind of operational space, then all sorts of weird things happen. And it might be that um, you, um, it might be that you can do things like violate Bell inequalities. So of course, I haven't proven that. Um, but it's not inconceivable. At least it's not as inconceivable as it might have been at the beginning of this lecture. And then the last approach is, um, is that perhaps you can extract some sort of principles, sort of leverage, leveraging on the work for axiomatization, from, from, you know, um, from try, trying to find axioms and postulates for quantum theory. Maybe you can find axioms and postulates from both of these kinds of approaches and bring them together and use those to construct uh, a theory of quantum gravity. Um, Okay, so all of, the, all of the work on quantum gravity is still uh, very tentative. Okay, I'll stop there. Um, well, I have other questions, but one thing I was curious about, just to see how you approach it, is that uh, there's, uh, in classical GR, there's ways people handle observables by introducing things like asymptotic infinity. Struggling to find local descriptions on the manifold, mm -hmm. and they don't, they don't exist, obviously. Uh, so it's kind of a sort of flee for the mountains kind of approach, mm -hmm. you know, but they don't exist there. So let's go to infinity and see if we can do something. Right. Um, so um, whilst you might you might or might not be able to capture it within this approach, but it's not really motivated once you take this approach because now you have a, a space, not the manifold space, a different space where you do have a local description of the world. Uh, and it's a perfectly good local description, and uh, you can you can work from, from there. Um, yeah. So um, yeah. So that that's. Show you how to make a clock. Uh, and of course, uh, if general relativity is correct, you should be able to describe, you know, how any clock works. Like even the one that's in this, so, even the whole cell phone, you should be able to describe it in terms of the fields in GI. You probably couldn't because of the various quantum stuff going on. Um, but um, if it were correct, you should be able to describe the construction of a clock. Um, but here, at least, is a very simple clock you can construct within this within GI that has the necessary properties. So take um, take um, Two different types of fluid that are miscible, okay, fluid one and fluid two, and, um, and have form a blob which has fluid one in the center and fluid two, uh, and the aspect of his one is two. So just a very symmetric blob uh, formed in that way. And, and now just let the thing go. And because the two fluids are miscible, they will diffuse into each other. And you'll be able to see in this kind of scalar space. Um, you'll be able to see the, 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 the measure time because the, um, 
you can have a scalar field described in your math, which is going to be a, a good one and a good two. And so uh, over time, you'll see those two things mixing into each other. And that will be witnessed in this operational space. So this is a very primitive type of plot that you can build within um, GR. Uh, other things like test particles, which play an important role in, um, in, in setting up general relativity, I understand very much about it by those. You can approximate those as all this theorem is showing that you know, sufficiently small blobs of fluid will follow uh, geodesics. Um, a lot of work has been done on that. Um, um, so any kind of instrument you think about, um, you, 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 sh you, 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 sh you can try, you can think about how to build it out of, uh, out of the basic fields. And I think that's the right approach, because if you just bring these objects in from nowhere, you might get into, into problems. <coughs> About this agency here, is this a physical field or is it? What is its status? It's its status. So let's just take let's try to take a conservative point of view, so not doing anything wacky. Because the moment you mention agency, people already think you're kind of being wacky, which I don't mind. I'm happy to be regarded as wacky, but um, we don't need to be. So um, so it really just describes. Um, I mean, you kind of think of it as describing the, the state of the neurons in, in, in the brain, or, or in the example I described, it might be better to think of it as describing the, the, the angle of the sail that the captain sets. And you can change this. Now, the, the thing is that the, 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 if, you write down, if you just write down field equations that don't tell you how this, that don't go into sufficient detail to tell you how this angle is set, then they're not going to be a complete set of equations. So you have to kind of give the agency fields. So it's an effect. Yeah. So it could be ultimately physically determined, yeah. Um, um, it'd be interesting to know, so within this classical general relativity, it, you can imagine it's ultimately physically determined. Of course, if you use this as a launch pad to go into quantum gravity, then the status of the agency fields may change. Uh, you know, uh, it's difficult to say what will happen, because you know, what's, what's the status of agent choices in, in, in quantum theory? Uh, so there's a whole set of questions that um, would um, open up in that case. I find, I find that interesting. solution in some, well, you're going to give it the, the whole universe, or, or sure. Sure. Okay, so then, then your region A is just everything. Yeah. Okay, so you give me the Schwarzschild solution, and you're probably going to write it down like this, because it's in some, actually, more than that, you have an X, you have some representative on some, right. on some right. in some coordinate system, or some set of coordinates, some charts, some atlas. Um, but now, uh, the Psi is, is where you've taken the diffeomorphism of all those uh, mm -hmm. So now you're going to, um, now you're going to approximate with these different morphisms. Uh, right, but you said that there's a way of, so, so we take the equivalence class of all those different morph, all of those uh, solutions that you generate by different morphisms, and then yeah. you apply sort to it, and somehow you get out. No, the, the one thing is, is if, if you get some, if you, if you combine solutions which are pure. How uh, do I know what's a pure solution? Sorry. Okay, so the pure solution is one where if you any two any two members in the in the set can be related by a different morphism. Ah, okay. Yeah. okay. So they're physically equivalent in that sense. Okay, okay, that's, that's what okay, okay, sorry, sorry, yeah, yeah. that wasn't clear before.